Well, good day, everybody from Northern Michigan. This is Dr. Bob, Bob the Science Guy. You know, as an internal medicine physician, one of the more common problems that I deal with is diabetes. And I find that a lot of my patients do better if they're better educated about the disease process itself. So I thought I'd put together this little presentation, maybe to give you a hand a little bit, answer a few of your questions. So let's cue up the music and get started. In this inaugural episode, I'd like to talk about diabetes mellitus. This is a very common disease and I've diagnosed hundreds of people with it. I've always viewed the treatment of diabetes as a partnership between the patient and the physician. I always gave my patients a little talk when I first diagnosed them. The main characteristic of diabetes is high blood sugar. It's a problem with insulin metabolism and the ability of the body to handle sugar. Insulin is required for the metabolism of carbohydrates in the body, and diabetes is one of the earliest described diseases in human beings, going all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. Prior to the 1920s and the development of insulin, it was universally fatal in childhood. There are four basic types of diabetes. There's type 1 or juvenile diabetes. The most common is type 2 or adult onset diabetes. We also have have gestational diabetes and diabetes secondary to other conditions such as pancreatitis or drugs. In 2011, nearly 400 million people worldwide had diabetes and 90% were type 2. Just a real quick breakdown of the worldwide distribution of diabetes. You see the top three countries now and predicted in 2030 are India, China, and the United States. Good diets and good public health education tend to decrease the rates of diabetes. Obesity and poverty tend to increase it. To go into a little bit more detail on the types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes is characterized by a lack of insulin. It can only be treated with insulin. Type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. Patients with type 2 diabetes tend to be obese, and the problem that they have is that they make as much, if not more, insulin than is normal, but their body doesn't act on it like a normal person would. They have diabetes due to other diseases, for example, uh, autoimmune damage to the pancreas or pancreatitis. Uh, some drugs can predispose you to either insulin resistance or decrease the amount of insulin produced. The final type of diabetes commonly seen is what is called gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Now, if you look at the list on that right column down at the bottom, you'll see that this generally occurs in women. Tell me that doctors don't have a sense of humor. Type 1 diabetes or the lack of insulin tends to develop early in life, generally in childhood before age 10. Type 2 diabetes uh, generally comes up in puberty or adulthood. One of the characteristics of insulin resistance is something called acanthosis nigricans. As you notice on this patient's where the folds over his knuckles are, the skin is a little bit thickened and darkened. That's acanthosis nigricans. It's also seen around the folds of the neck and under the arms. It's not seen in all type 2 diabetes. If you see this, it's a good sign of insulin resistance. Now, as noted, there is a secondary form of diabetes related to disease or drugs that's related to the underlying condition or the medication. Gestational diabetes occurs in pregnancy generally in the third trimester. One complication of diabetes during pregnancy is very large babies on the order of 10 pounds. Now, when we start talking about treatment, the first thing that we should really talk about is insulin itself. Dr. Frederick Benting was a Canadian surgeon who started doing some of the early work on insulin assisted by his lab assistant, Charles Best. Working with dogs, they were able to isolate the cells that produce insulin from the pancreas. Our associate biochemist James Collip was able to isolate the insulin from those extracts. For their work, they received the Nobel Prize in 1923. The first patient they treated with this extract was a child in the hospital in Toronto dying of ketoacidosis. The first American patient treated was the daughter of the American Secretary of State. After receiving the Nobel Prize, Banting sold the patent for insulin to the University of Toronto for a dollar. Now let's take a couple of minutes and talk about insulin, uh, how it's made, what it does, and what organs it affects. Now your pancreas is an organ uh, deep in the pit of your stomach. 
right in front of your spine. And it has two basic functions. The first function is to secrete pancreatic enzymes into your intestine to help with your digestion of your food. And that's this path down here. The second is as an endocrine organ, which means that it secretes hormones into your bloodstream. Uh, one of the major ones, of course, being insulin. Now, insulin starts off as a large molecule called proinsulin. It's a big spiral molecule with two cross bonds in it. Now, an enzyme will break off the tip of it right here and create two more molecules. One is called a C-peptide, and the remainder of the proinsulin is insulin. So that's the insulin, and that little fragment there is called the C-peptide. That'll be important later. You can see how the pancreatic enzymes go into the gut, and then the insulin goes directly into the blood. The pro-insulin is cleaved by the enzyme, forming a C-peptide on the left and insulin on the right. Now, insulin affects several different structures in the body. It affects the fat cells, it affects the liver, and it affects the muscles. Your body's abilities of self-preservation are amazing. If you are starving, your liver will actually undergo something called gluconeogenesis and create glucose. Under conditions of low blood sugar, your fat will break down and create glucose and fatty acids. And finally, your muscles will start breaking down and generate glucose from that as well to keep your body alive. In times of plenty, when you have plenty of uh, sugar running around in your blood, your liver will build up glycogen for future use. It'll store fat for future energy uses, and it'll, your muscles will absorb amino acids and bulk up. Now, many people with type 2 diabetes have something called metabolic syndrome. They have central obesity, high blood pressure, high blood sugar due to insulin resistance, high triglycerides, and low HDL, or good cholesterol. They are predisposed to a number of conditions to include heart disease, strokes, and diabetes. Now let's discuss the treatment of diabetes. All treatments for diabetes begin with diet. In some cases, we will need insulin. In other cases, we can treat the insulin resistance with oral medicines. Now, one thing that I mentioned uh, when we talked about the secretion of proinsulin, remember that that enzyme cleaved off the C-peptide and made C-peptide and insulin. One of the ways you can tell what type of diabetes somebody has is whether or not they have any C-peptide in their blood. If they don't have any C-peptide, they are not making insulin and they are a type 1 diabetic. As I mentioned a moment ago, if you are a type 1 diabetic, you must be treated with insulin. If you do have C-peptide, you're a type 2 diabetic and there's a possibility of treating you with oral medicines. Now, as I said, the treatment of diabetes begins with diet. If you are a diabetic, you do not have flexibility in your diet. You should always eat breakfast about the same time, eat lunch about the same time, eat supper about the same time. The goal of this diet is not necessarily to count calories. It's to make sure that your breakfast is a consistent caloric intake, your lunch is a consistent caloric intake, and your supper is a consistent caloric intake. What I always tell my patients is that the amount of food that they eat should fit into the palm of one of their hands. No more, no less. The key to it is consistency. I want your blood sugar at 9 o'clock this morning to be exactly the same as it was at 9 o'clock yesterday morning and at what it will be at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. My medicines will not help you if your blood sugars are all over the map. It's like trying to hit a fly with a BB gun. Now let's talk about the different insulin therapies with the different types of insulin. When do we use them? How do we use them? How do we choose which one to use? Now, to understand proper insulin therapy, we want to remember the normal body's reaction to glucose. That's the top graph up there. We have a baseline level of sugar in the blood and a baseline level of insulin. As we eat, we get a bolus of glucose that comes in, and we get a squirt of insulin from our pancreas to cover that and bring us back down to normal. 
The first type of insulin that came out was made from pigs and cows. Basically, it was what we call regular insulin. It was short acting. The way that we used it was that every time we ate, we would go ahead and take a shot of regular insulin to try and cover that bump in our sugars and keep our sugars in a normal level. That's very short acting and very as needed. To improve that a little bit in the 50s, we came out with something called NPH insulin or N-insulin. N-insulin was an intermittent acting insulin. It generally was given at uh, in the morning to cover the lunch and at lunchtime to cover supper. It also had a little bit of baseline action in between. So it was a little bit better than our insulin. In the late 90s, we developed what's called Lantus Insulin. It is a single 24-hour insulin shot that you take once a day. It mimics the baseline insulin of our body because it releases insulin slowly all day long. Now, for meals, we go ahead and use a short-acting R insulin to cover those. This mimics the normal body's reaction to sugar very closely. Now, while insulin can be used with all types of diabetes and is, in fact, required to be used in type 1 diabetes and generally in gestational diabetes as well, for type 2 diabetics, which are the majority, we can use oral medicines. Now, while we understand that insulin just replaces the body's insulin that is needed, oral medicines generally tend to hit the exact cause of type 2 diabetes. Number one, they cause the pancreas, which puts out some insulin already, to put out even more to overcome the insulin resistance. The second way that it'll work is that it'll actually work on those insulin receptors and make them work a little bit better. A classic example of that is metformin or glucophage there to the right. And the last way that they work is they tend to decrease the absorption of sugar by making you uh, spill it out in your gut. For most of my type 2 diabetics, Throughout my practice, I used combinations of the uh, first two and occasionally had to, to add some Lantus insulin or the long-acting insulin for some of my problem cases. Now, we monitor your blood sugar in three basic ways. The first is that we do blood sugar testing uh, where you do a finger stick several times a day, generally before meals. Sometimes we'll ask you to do one in the middle of the night to check for something, but it's generally just before you eat your meals. About every three months in the office, we'll get a blood test called a hemoglobin A1C. A hemoglobin A1C is a blood test... Um, of the hemoglobin molecules. And what happens is as these hemoglobin molecules are exposed to blood sugar, they rust a little bit is the easiest way to describe it. The higher the sugar concentration in the blood, the more rust we get. It's a good estimate of what your blood sugar was over the last three months. A normal blood sugar is about 100 and a normal hemoglobin A1c is about six and a half percent. For every percent above six and a half, your blood sugar on average is about 30 milligrams higher. So if your blood sugar is about 130, you would expect a hemoglobin A1C of about seven and a half percent. Eight and a half percent would be an average blood sugar of 160 and so forth. I've had about 12 or 14 patients in my practice that came in with hemoglobin A1Cs around 25 percent. Most new diabetics come in between 12 and 14 percent and we get them down to about six and a half, seven percent within a couple of months. Another thing that we have to have a look at uh, is we need to monitor the patient for two things. One, the medications that we use to treat diabetes can be hard on the liver and the kidneys, so we want to keep an eye on those. Second, diabetes itself causes damage to your eyes, damage to your kidneys. Uh, it is the leading cause of non-traumatic below-the-knee amputation due to foot infections. So we need to really keep a close eye on your health in general. And as a diabetic, it is essential you inspect your own feet every single day, including turning them over as best you can and looking at the bottoms. I've had many patients that came into my office just for their routine exam. I did a foot check on them and found a thumbtack in their heel. Now, we do have some pretty significant problems with diabetes. The first and foremost is something called diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, one thing I want to clarify with ketoacidosis, if you are a type 1 diabetic and you do not have enough insulin, what happens is your body cannot use sugars. As a result, your fats break down and form ketones. Your body can use these ketones for energy, most of your body at least. Your brain, however, needs sugar, and to use that sugar, it needs insulin. 
if you don't have the insulin, you become unconscious pretty quickly. Because of the excess sugar, your body tries to urinate it out and you become dehydrated. Ketone metabolism makes you very acidotic. Your blood becomes very vinegar-like. If untreated, diabetic ketoacidosis is fatal very quickly. As it is, you're going to be in the intensive care unit for a few days while they fluid resuscitate you and get your insulin and sugars under control and probably spend a week in the hospital after that. This generally occurs in type 1 diabetics but can, on rare occasions, occur in type 2. It is a life-threatening emergency. As I mentioned, diabetic foot infections are the leading cause of non-traumatic below-the-knee amputations in the United States. You also have a higher than normal incidence of heart disease, kidney failure, and stroke. You can also get significant erectile dysfunction. Well, that was a quick 20-minute overview of three years of medical school. This is good information on a patient level to kind of give you some idea of what we're doing with diabetes. Every doctor has their own technique of how they want to approach diabetes. We all follow some basic standards, but we all have our own little way of doing things. So something that I particularly like to do, your doctor may not like to do and vice versa. It doesn't mean either one of us are wrong. It's just different approaches to the same problem. When in doubt, always do what your physician asks you to do. And if anything, this presentation may give you some good questions to ask your doctor the next time you see him. Well, thank you for stopping by. I do appreciate you visiting with me. Now this time we talked about diabetes. Next time we're going to talk about another very common condition in internal medicine, chronic pain. And I think that you'll be interested in it. So hit the little like and subscribe button down there in the corner. Make sure you hit that bell icon so that you know when the videos are out. And I'll see you next week with chronic pain. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thanks for stopping by.